So there's one more uh, word problem we're going to do before we jump into cross products. So this last problem is going to be computing work. So this is work in the physics sense, not in the economic sense. <clears throat> so work, we're going to use W generally for work. So what work is, is a force times a displacement. And when we say times, we mean dot product. Where F is the force vector. And D is the displacement vector. And usually the displacement vector, you're going to do N minus start. That's how you turn two points into a vector. You take the end point minus the beginning point. So we saw that before. I drew out a funny little bow and arrow like this for a vector. So you do n minus start. All right, that's how we're going to compute work. So we're only going to do one example here. You're pulling a 50-pound uh, wagon. Across flat ground. at an angle of 30 degrees. And it's going to move 100 feet. And compute the work done. All right, so first thing we're going to do is draw out what is going on. So we have some flat ground, easy to draw. We're going to be pulling at an angle of 30 degrees. That's 30 degrees above the flat ground. And we're going to move 100 feet. So I need to compute two things. The displacement vector for this one is going to be easy to compute. So I could write out two points, or I could just write down the displacement vector. So what is the x component of displacement vector? 100. 100. So we're going to the right, so we're going to go positive 100. And what about vertical component? Zero. Zero. So we got no up, no down. So just 100 to the right. Uh, I also have to specify how much we're pulling. So let's say you're pulling with a force of 80 pounds. That seems like a, a lot of force to pull over wagon that doesn't weigh that much. Let's go at 20 pounds. It's probably more reasonable. All right, how in the world do we write this force vector out? It is not okay to just write F equals 20. That is not a vector. So how do we write a vector in polar coordinates? So we have a magnitude out front. And then we have the unit vector in the direction. So our magnitude, we'll just write as magnitude f. And we have cos theta sine theta. So this is how we write in polar form. 
you basically pull the radius out, also known as the magnitude, and then you have a unit vector in the right direction. So the magnitude is 20, that's where the 20 goes, and our angle here is 30 degrees. So cos 30 is square root of 3 over 2, sine 30 is 1 half, and we can distribute that 20. So we have 10 square root of 3 comma 10. So there's our force vector. All we have to do to get the work is use the formula above, which is force uh, dot product with displacement. So we just do that one computation. Work equals F dot D. This is an easy dot product to compute. So 100 square root 3 times 100, or 10 square root 3 times 100, plus 10 times 0. Now if you're measuring uh, force in pounds and uh, distance in feet, the unit is called foot pounds. So this is the work done. Now, one thing you'll notice is what happened to this 10? Was that really, that 10 that was the upward pulling, did that contribute at all to the work? No. Nope. So what really happened is if you break down the vector, you, the pull vector into the projection and the orthogonal projection, the orthogonal part doesn't count in work. So whatever you pull in a direction not with the way you're moving, all that is thrown away, basically. So it only counts the uh, projection or the part of the vector that goes in that direction. So all the other work is thrown away uh, when you actually, or all the other effort is thrown away when you compute work. Just like if you would move uh, something without wheels, like a table, you have to pick it up, and so you spend a lot of effort lifting it off the ground just to move it 10 feet across the room. So all that lifting up is not counted in work. If you just start on the ground and end on the ground, all the up and down movement doesn't count in the end. So our next section is cross products. This is not in your regular textbook, so the book uh, reference is in the files on Canvas. I think it's just called crossproduct.pdf or something like that, cross product reference, and it's three pages. And um, that's where you can find uh, more information on cross products. But hopefully this will be thorough enough right here. So <coughs> cross product, the word that should be familiar is product. We just looked at a product we just finished with and it was a dot product. So this is going to be a similar product, uh, but it's going to be computed very differently. Uh, well, the only thing that's really similar is the way that it interacts with addition. That's why it's called product. So it distributes across addition. Uh, other than that, there's really not much in common with uh, the dot product. So cross product exists only in three dimensions. So it's only in R3. I'll write down how to compute it now. So we'll have vectors v and w. So v is going to be a1 i. And let's go with diamond notation. a1, b1, c1. And w will be a2, b2, c2.
So the definition of a cross product will be B1C2 minus B2C1 I plus A1C2 minus A2C1 J plus a1, B2, minus A2, B1, K. So I do not have the definition memorized, which is why I copied it right out of my notes. So this is a, this is the definition, but it's a tedious way to compute it because you have to memorize this right here. And it's very easy to mess up subscripts. So we're going to compute it in, in a different way. So this is the determinant of the matrix It's the determinant of this matrix. All right, so in pre-calculus one, we studied determinants, or at least I taught determinants if you weren't in my pre-calculus one class. Uh, maybe you didn't get determinants. So what in the world's a determinant? So who's heard of determinants? Sort of three. So we're going to do row expansion on the first row. So the way determinants work, it's I times the determinant of the uh, matrix with row I and the column with I in it taken out. So temporarily, I'm going to block out the column that I is appearing in. And this matrix is called a minor or a submatrix. It's the matrix that's left over. So it's the matrix down here. So if you ignore the row I is in and the column I is in, what you're left with is B1, C1. B2, C2. The other thing we have to pay attention to is the sign. The sign alternates. <coughs> so here is a 3 by 3 sign matrix, and we are going across the top right there. So that means next up is J, but instead of being plus J, it's minus J. And now we're going to throw out the column that J lives in. So we're getting rid of row one and now column two. And what's left over is A1, C1, A2, C2. And we're going to do the same thing for K. And this one is plus. We're alternating signs. So in this last one, we'll write down the matrix left over. The 2 by 2 matrix that's left over. Yeah, write it down with your pencil. All right. Now, you probably can't erase as easily as I can, so what I recommend you do is take your finger or second pen and cover up that column that you're trying to block out so you don't accidentally, so you don't accidentally use like those and then that, for example. You don't want to do, make that mistake. You want to make sure things are lined up nicely. So I recommend you use a, a second pencil or your finger and cover up the, uh, the column that you're trying to work on. All right, what in the world are these two by two determinants now? So two by two determinants, you can write down in a nice formula. And I'll write it down here. So you have A, B, C, D. It's A, D minus B, C. And this is something that you need to memorize.
one way to think about it is you're basically going on the diagonals, and when you go uh, up on the diagonal, you're subtracting. So that's another way to memorize this. You're basically working on the two diagonals. So now it's time to do an example. So we'll do two, three, five, one, two, three. So I will get you started on the first two. I always recommend circle the first row because you're always going to expand across the first row. So go ahead and circle that. You can even write the form out. It's going to be I times a determinant minus J times a determinant plus K times another determinant. And now I'm going to carefully fill in the first submatrix. So I want to cover up the I column. We have 3, 5, 2, 3. And I'm going to go ahead and compute the determinant of this 3, 5, 2, 3 matrix. So the determinant is 3 times 3 minus 2 times 5. So that's the determinant of the 2 by 2. So take a minute and write down the other two matrices and then their determinants and simplify it down. And I'll walk around and answer any questions that you have because this is probably a new process for most of you.
So any questions on minus i minus j plus k? So this is ijk form. If you want diamond notation, minus 1, minus 1, positive 1. So what did this represent right here? Which two vectors crossed together? So this was, yep, this was 2, 3, 5, cross product with 1, 2, 3. So that's, what, that's how you do the cross product right there. So now, on the next example, I want you to reverse the order. So the way we compute cross products, we put them into a matrix, the ijk matrix. Your first vector appears first. Your second vector appears last. So do the exact same thing for this matrix. You're not going to get the same answer. You'll get something similar, but you will not get the same answer. So I'll just give you a minute for this, start to finish. So any cross product questions on 1, 1, negative 1? How does that relate back to what we got in the other order? The so the opposite in what sense? So they're negatives of each other. So this is our first algebraic property. So u cross v, if we change the order, it's negative v cross u. So if that negative sign was not there, we would call this commutative property. But because a negative sign is there, this is anti-commutative. So that's our first property.
So if I have the zero vector, in this case, I know we're in three dimensions. So this is the three dimensional zero vector, zero, zero, zero. What would I get in this case? Let's think I, J, K, A, B, C, zero, zero, zero. So we start writing this out. This is I times the determinant of B, C, zero, zero. There's plus other things. But just think about this first one. What is this two by two determinant of BC zero zero? Zero. Oh, zero, very good. So you got basically each one of them is gonna be times zero. So you should be able to tell the other two terms would have to be zero because they would have zeros on the bottom. So if I do a cross with zero, what I get is not the number zero, I get the zero vector out of this. So remember cross product is always gonna be a vector, not a number. Scalar multiples, so alpha times u cross v. You could write it as alpha u cross v, or you can write it as u cross alpha v. Those are the three ways to write it. <coughs> you can move your scalar around. And the main reason we call this a product is because of the way that interacts with addition. So if you multiply across addition, you get to distribute. So those are the algebraic properties of a cross product. Of course, you need to know how to compute it as well. And now we'll look at the uh, geometric properties of cross product. So these are all algebraic. Now we're going to look at geometric properties. So I want you to draw a right hand looking like this. If you suck at drawing, just copy what I do. I'm not terribly good either. So there's one finger, there's the other finger. Uh-oh, it's going the wrong way. Hold on, I have to look. Uh, I have the advantage because I'm left-handed, so I can look at my right hand as I draw. You probably can't. Oh, it's a bad thumb. Perfect, there we go. I've drawn way better hands than that. Let me start over. All right, that's a little better. All right, so inside your right hand, there's going to be three vectors. They're all going to originate from that point. That's whatever that joint's called in your thumb, kind of. So one vector, two vector, three vector. So those are your three fingers. And it has this nice property. The cross product of two vectors is always going to be perpendicular to each of those vectors individually. So if I redraw this without the hand, let me pull these vectors out and draw them next to it. So we got u, v, u cross v. So I'll draw the stylized picture of your right hand over here. So the idea is u cross v is perpendicular. Perpendicular. U L A R. 
to u and v Now, none of this makes sense if one of these vectors is 0, because we saw if you do a cross product with 0 vector, you're going to get 0. So your thumb would be like 0, or it wouldn't be pointing any direction in particular. Uh, so as long as your vectors aren't both 0, you'll have to get a perpendicular vector. And the way it works, just take your right hand, make your middle finger and your index finger. Uh, so make sure you don't flick people off. So this is not the right way to do it. <laughs> this is the right way to do it. So put your right hand up and make this gesture. I know some of you are too cool and it doesn't matter. All right, your middle finger plays an important role. Yeah, you're not just number one. All right, so your thumb is where the cross product's gonna point. So a good way to think about it is if your vectors are living in the plane of your table, so have your first two fingers parallel with your table and your thumb points directly upwards. All right, that's the way the right hand rule works. So let's think about, so this means your first finger is your U and second finger is your V. So I want you to switch, switch your fingers, U and V. So whatever direction you're pointing right now, you can, you can have U point directly at me and then your V probably points out the window. I want you to switch so that uh, you switch your fingers, but don't do it by flicking people off. Rotate at your wrist and elbow and whatnot. Tell me what happens to your thumb. <laughs> All right, so my vector is pointing, one's right at you, and the other one for me is the hallway. Your second vector is pointing out the window, however. So I want you to switch your fingers around so that they're pointing the same directions, but the other finger, your fingers are swapping. And what happens in order to do that, your thumb turns upside down. I know this is way less comfortable than the first, the first way to hold your hand. All right, but my point is, when you swap vectors, your thumb flips over. <laughs> oh. I thought you ran with a different crowd. <laughs> All right. So my point is, you switch fingers and your thumb turns over, all right? So that should be what's happening with your hand. If you, oh no, there we go. Yeah, okay. So that's the right hand rule. So it's called the right hand rule. Uh, this comes from the way that we multiply, or the way that we take uh, determinants uh, so the other properties, geometric properties of cross products are the uh, ways to compute areas and angles. So we'll start with the angle. So the angle property u cross v divided by magnitude u magnitude v. This looks a lot like the cosine, which I shouldn't have said because I started writing cosine. Uh, this looks a lot like the cosine property, except cosine in the numerator used dot product. So this one uses cross product. And let's think about the numerator right here. Cross product, u cross v, gives us a vector. So that means the vertical bars are not absolute value, they're magnitude of that vector. So keep that in mind. The numerator here is a vector, and then we take the magnitude, so we'll get a number. And of course, the other two magnitudes are both numbers. So this turns into one number right here. And that's the sign between two uh, vectors. Can this ever be negative? Think about one magnitude divided by two more magnitudes. It's always gotta be positive, right? And let's think about the sine function. Let's think small angle. What's the sine of a small angle? Is what, uh, between what values, if it's less than 90 degrees, what would your sine be? Between which numbers? Zero and one. So if you've got a small angle, you're between 0 and 1. 
And if you have a larger angle, an obtuse angle, right there. Now it turns out your sign's also between 0 and 1. So if you're directly 90 degrees, your sign's 1. And then as your angle gets bigger, the sign of that angle actually gets smaller. Uh, so it's better to use co the cosine identity if you really want to think about angles. It's better to use the cosine than the sine identity. The, uh, so I'll write that one down. Uh, cos theta. So the second one is generally preferred, so more useful and easier, way easier to compute. So the sine identity is not that useful. You already have one for cosine, and it's, it's generally going to work out a lot better. So there's our angle identity. Now we'll go for the area. Uh, properties. So the first one's area of a parallelogram. So we're going to start out with two vectors, u and b. And how do I make a parallelogram based off two vectors? So two more parallel vectors, or basically copies of these vectors, just shifted over. So we have one vector going up here, another like that. So there's our par parallelogram. So if you just have basically two sides, you can only make one parallelogram based off those two sides. And you're just copying the two sides and moving them over. All right, area. We use A for the area, area of the parallelogram is just the magnitude of u cross v. That is how to compute the area of this parallelogram. And now the area of a triangle will have the same initial setup how do I turn this situation into a triangle? One line. It's just one line, just close off the side, basically. So we have this one line right here. And there's our triangle. Now what I'm going to do is draw the parallelogram right on top of this. So that's the area I actually want. And here's the completed parallelogram. How does the triangle relate to the parallelogram in area? It's half. You do have to rotate. The easy way to see it, just think about that middle point. If you rotate the green triangle right at that middle point, you'll be right on top of the other triangle. So this area is one half of the parallelogram area. So it's one half magnitude of u cross v. Speaking of parallel, let's look at uh, parallel vectors. How did we figure out if two ve vectors are parallel before? So if they're positive multiples of the other one, then they're in the same direction. If they're negative multiples, you can call that anti-parallel, but they're going the opposite direction. So that's how we uh, decided if two vectors are parallel or not. Uh, we can look at the angle between parallel vectors. So here's two par parallel vectors. What's the angle between those two vectors? Zero. Zero. So there's, uh, they're the exact same vector. So what is sine of zero? Sine zero is zero. 
And we also know sine zero is u cross v over magnitude u magnitude v. So this equals zero. Assuming your vectors are not both zero themselves. Oops, I need that magnitude at the top. Let's multiply by the denominator because fractions suck. And we get zero equals uh, magnitude of u cross v. So one way to tell two vectors are parallel, the scenic route is take their cross product, and if you get zero, they're parallel. So parallel vectors have a zero. In this case, we mean a zero vector cross product. So that's for parallel vectors. What about anti-parallel vectors? They're pointing the opposite direction. What angle is between anti-parallel vectors? What angle is a flat angle? So that would be pi or 180. And what is sine of pi? So we're on the left side of the unit circle, and we want the y-coordinate. So sine pi is 0. So just like before, if you look at what we just computed, that means there will be anti-parallel if their cross product is 0. So unfortunately, if their cross product is 0, you don't know if they go the same direction or the exact opposite direction. But that's why we have a much better way looking and seeing if they're multiples. So this is parallel vectors or anti-parallel. We got time for one problem. So find a unit vector orthogonal u equals 3i minus 2j minus k and w equals 2i minus j plus 3k. So what does it mean to be orthogonal to these two vectors? If I drew out what they are, I want a vector that is perpendicular or orthogonal to both of those two. Is this the first time I'm using orthogonal? Yeah. Okay, good. I think I said it before. It means the same thing as perpendicular. All right, how do you take two vectors and get a third vector that's orthogonal? You can use your right hand, but you have to name the operation that your right hand is doing. So what's the name of the section? Cross product. So we're going to take these two vectors, cross them, and then we'll get the thumb vector, or the orthogonal vector. So do that right now. So line up your ijk. And compute this out. So same thing we did at the beginning of class.
So any cross product questions on this vector? Is this a unit vector? How do you know if this is a unit vector or not? What needs to be one? Not the third coordinate. Not the first coordinate. What property of a vector has to be one for it to be a unit vector? The magnitude. So this vector is way too long. So let's figure out how long this vector is. Get the magnitude. So magnitude is going to be square root of these three squared added together. So 49 plus 1 is 50 plus 121. All right, so square root 171. It's a little bit bigger than square root 169, which is 13 squared. So that's a way bigger vector than we want. So what we're going to do is divide the vector by its magnitude, and we'll have a length 1 vector. So we did this in the last section back in the dot product section, or the vector section, one of those two. So our unit vector is this vector right here. So let's see, I used u and w, we'll call this vector v. So our unit vector is going to be v divided by magnitude v. So we just take a vector and divide by its magnitude. That's how we get a unit vector. Now, <clears throat> I didn't teach you about scalar division, mainly because there is no such thing as division, even though we keep saying that word. What we really mean is multiply by the reciprocal, and you can distribute this in. I personally like this form the most where you leave your reciprocal of your uh, magnitude outside. So I like to look at that one. So we only have one more example to go in cross products, and then we'll be out of this section.